Welcome everyone to our board of directors meeting. Uh, first order of business is to call the roll. Secretary, would you please call the roll? Trustee Atkins. Present. Trustee Kanata. Present. Trustee Carroll. Present. Trustee Jenkins. Present. Trustee Luck. Present. Trustee Malone. Present. Trustee May. Present. Trustee Mueller. Present. Trustee O'Malley. Trustee Rayburn. Present. We have a quorum. A couple of notes for the group. Our normal chairman, Mike O'Malley, is out today, so my sitting in for him is just temporary, just one meeting. He'll be back. Second thing is that we will have a break after a couple of uh, formal items on the agenda and a presentation. So if you don't mind just keeping your seat until that break for our TV cameras. Thank you. First item on our agenda is to um, the adoption of our agenda. Items on the agenda that need to be adopted. Before I call a vote, are there any items you wish to be extracted from the consent agenda? I move for adoption of the agenda, including the consent agenda items. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The agenda is adopted. Next, we need to approve the minutes. Minutes for September 14, 2018 board meeting were circulated in advance. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Say aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White, who'll introduce our speakers for a campus spotlight. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Kanata. You know, the, the life of an academic uh, institution is a little bit different from a lot of other complex organizations. We have about almost 1,000 employees, and of course now we serve nearly 11,000 students. And we operate in a culture of shared governance, which is really different from a lot of organizations, a lot of businesses and corporations. And I thought it would be uh, important that you meet some campus leaders who are liaisons to the faculty and staff and sit at the table. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about shared governance this afternoon, or, or actually later this morning in my concluding remarks. But now I'm really uh, pleased to invite Dr. Mickey Wadia and um, Ms. Louise Mitchell to the, the table here. And as they're coming up, I'll tell you a little bit about who they are. So Dr. Wadia is a professor of literature and languages, and he's, he's very well loved on campus for his, uh, not only his teaching, but his uh, work with study abroad. Um, he's been here a number of years, but he's here today as the president of the Faculty Senate. You will get very well acquainted with him uh, next year because he is the newly elected, uh, let's see, faculty trustee who will replace Dr. Nell Rayburn when her time expires in the summer. And so Dr. Wadia will be a frequent uh, visitor to this table, so we're happy to have him. Ms. Louise Mitchell is uh, also here in her capacity as the president of the Staff Senate. Now, her, her day job, of course, is the coordinator of the Hispanic Cultural Center, uh, and she comes from a military family. Her husband is current, uh, currently serving military, and so we're really happy to have her perspective here today. So Dr. Wadi is going to start, and then when he finishes, um, Ms. Mitchell will conclude, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions if you'd like at the end. And then in my remarks, I'll wrap up um, and kind of follow what they say a little bit later this morning. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. As I can remember a time when I was not connected in some form or manner to governance of the faculty senate at Penn State University. I'm a professor of Shakespeare and technical writing. My doctoral degree was completed at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette in December of 1987 in Shakespeare studies. I joined the Department of Languages and Literature in the summer of 1993, and I've been here for 25 years. 
I'm also the campus representative for CCSA, the Cooperative Center for Study Abroad, a consortium headquartered at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green. And it is a passion of mine to take students to London on a biennial basis and other far-flung destinations on study abroad experiences, something I have doing passionately since 1997. Since the late 90s, I've also served as the chair of the Faculty Handbook and Policy Committee and recently completed 20 years of service on that committee. I have written many, many words which are now part of the current retention, tenure, and promotion policies and standards at Austin P. State University. I currently serve as the president of the Faculty Senate and will serve later next year as the faculty representative to this noble and august body, the Board of Trustees. So I'm very happy to be here. I welcome you all this morning on behalf of the faculty at APSU. I have long maintained that if one is to forge his or her own destiny, one cannot just sit on the sidelines. Proactive engagement, positive interference, integrity, honesty, transparency, these are some of the things that are needed. However, you don't earn gravitas via a position. Valued leadership and respect must always be earned at this institution. My faculty mentor a long time ago suggested to me that the Senate would be a good place if one wanted a behind the scenes look at the school and its workings. I've always wanted to serve this school and APSU has several dedicated faculty members and staff who've given much of their time and energy in the service of this institution. And I enjoy very much being a part of a fine team. A recent blog post described shared governance as the process by which administration and faculty work together to make the university run. Each has a role, and each must respect the other's role and cooperate. AAUP describes this cooperation, that's the American Association of University Professors, as a weighted responsibility. Each side of the equation, administration and faculty, carries greater weight within their own sphere of expertise. This does not mean the other side is not involved at all, but that they carry less weight. Hence, administration has the greater weight in decisions about day-to-day -day business of running the university, like parking decisions, for example. And then the faculty has greater weight when it comes to decisions about education, creating the classes, creating courses, and curricula, particularly. In each type of decision, both sides should be in the loop. Article 1, Section 1 of our Constitution notes, the Faculty Senate shall investigate, consider, and act on any matter the Senate deems appropriate by virtue of relevance to the concerns of the university faculty. The Faculty Senate shall report fully to the university faculty and to other elements of the university when appropriate on all deliberations and actions of the Faculty Senate. The Senate shall be an advisory body to the president of the university. The president of the university may refer matters to the Senate and expect a response from that body. We are also empowered to organize ourselves, create our own bylaws, and discipline our own members, except as restricted by this Constitution. Representation in the Faculty Senate is proportional, based on the number of faculty in various disciplines. Since the numbers of faculty change over time, representation will be addressed in the bylaws so that necessary and appropriate adjustments might be more easily made. We usually hold general elections to positions coming open in the spring through a very specific nominations process. Sometimes we hold an interim election when faculty members resign or vacate their positions for a variety of reasons. For the most part, shared governance has been the hallmark of Austin Peay's strength and success in various constituencies working together to solve a problem. What is important here is the freedom of speech accorded and inherent in shared governance to question a decision or to discuss an issue further. Simply abiding by a ruling or a dictum can have potentially disruptive consequences when no good reasons have been advanced for decisions that can affect personnel or students. According to a recent commentary in the Chronicle of Higher Education, shared governance is not a simple matter of committee consensus or the faculties engaging administrators to take on the dirty work, or any number of other common misconceptions. Shared governance is much more complex. It is a delicate balance between faculty and staff participation in planning and decision-making processes on the one hand, and administrative accountability on the other. The key 
to genuine shared governance then is broad and unending communication. When various groups of people are kept in the loop and understand what developments are occurring within the university and when they are invited to participate as true partners, the institution prospers. That, after all, is our common goal. Shared governance has come to connote two complementary and sometimes overlapping concepts, giving various groups of people a share in key decision-making processes, often through elected representation, and allowing certain groups to exercise primary responsibility for specific areas of decision-making. We also have a very robust retention, tenure, and promotion process that is clearly spelled out in our policies and in the procedures and guidelines manuals that are tethered to these policies. We have made many useful and time-saving strides in this direction, streamlining the process along the way to make the whole task more transparent, more efficient, and easily navigable for personnel committees as well as faculty candidates. The policies are tweaked as necessary in order to ensure compliance with national best practices and procedures. At a typical Senate meeting, we invite the president and the provost to provide remarks at the front of the meeting, usually lasting between 10 or 15 minutes, and we ask questions of the faculty. Then we proceed to discussing matters of particular interest to the faculty, new curriculum issues, for example, tenure promotion issues, workload, etc. This segment is often followed by invitation to special guests and leaders on our campus to speak and get to know the faculty and for the faculty to know them. These individuals may be new sometimes to the university and we want our faculty to meet these fine folks and hear from them about issues in their area and their visions, which might also have wider relevance for the university's success as a whole. So, in terms of summary within this spotlight, I want to note that the way forward has to be an acknowledgement that shared governance suggests that faculty members are active decision makers. Faculty members will see issues differently from administrators or the board, and that is not a bad thing. Different perspectives enable creative conflict to occur, and out of that comes more informed decision making and more involvement from all constituencies. So on that note, thank you very much, President White and the Board of Trustees, for this opportunity to spotlight shared governance. Let's go pee. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It has been an honor and privilege uh, serving as Staff Senate President for this academic year. I have truly enjoyed being an advocate for my fellow colleagues. The Austin Peay State University Staff Senate is a comprehensive body that works coll collaboratively to ensure staff are actively involved in university governance and serves as a liaison between staff, faculty, and the administration to improve the quality of life experienced by all at the university. We accomplish this in a variety of ways. We talk openly about issues and advocating for action and improvements by proactively listening and addressing the needs and concerns identified by staff, especially during our staff senate meetings. We encourage the collaboration of staff throughout the university to foster service, change, and fellowship initiatives. And we also educate and inform our university constituents on all our deliberations and actions during our staff senate meetings. The Staff Senate's vision is to create and maintain a diverse and inclusive community aimed at serving, representing, and advocating for staff while enhancing communication at all levels to improve the quality of life at the university. We have 50 senators with a representation from academic affairs, advancement, communication and strategic initiatives, finance and administration, student affairs, and other areas. Representation in the Staff Senate is based on a ratio of one representative and one alternate per 20 employees, or major fraction thereof. There are over 600 of us. Staff members must have completed their six-month probationary period. Staff members are also able to nominate someone who feel would serve our staff well. Staff members also have the opportunity to nominate themselves. The Staff Senate officers consist of President, Vice President Dr. Ashley Spearman, Treasurer Lorneth Peters, and Secretary Jenny Rhodes. 
We also have our executive committee members that assist in the planning and driving the agenda of our staff senate meetings. Kelly Carpenter, Charles Booth, Crystal Faulkner, and Wes Powell. These individuals are essential members of the staff senate and I value their input and guidance greatly. I honestly couldn't manage to do what I do without them. Staff Senate has nine internal committees. We have the Awards Committee, Constitution and Bylaws Committee, Membership and Elections Committee. We have our Staff Appreciation Committee that does really great work for Staff Appreciation Week. Staff Concerns Committee, Sustainability Committee, and the Strategic Planning Committee. Again, great work comes out of these committees. Some of them include the creation of our own strategic plan, which we've modeled after the university's strategic plan the revitalization of our mission and vision statements, the staff compensation recommendations that um, lots of conversation has occurred with that. So we've, we've really valued uh, being at the table for that. And we've also created a sustainability plan. Staff Senate members also serve on 19 of the university standing committees, which provides recommendations to President White. Being part of the shared governance model allows staff to be part of the shared decision making it allows staff to have a voice and be an essential part of the team, which allows us to make a difference to the university committee community. The liberty to give input through staff senate meetings, which I relay back to President White, and also in the university standing committees results in creating a culture of success for our students. At a meeting I attended recently, it was pointed out that faculty members have students roughly six hours out of the day. And staff members from across all the divisions have them the rest of the day. For that reason, shared governance is essential. It provides a structure for all of us to be united, to be a united front for our students. We're engaged with students throughout our daily processes and are able to give greater insight that could impact student success. In the end, staff, faculty, and administration are here to serve our students to ensure that they have an impactful educational and co-curricular experience where they can be successful after graduation. I believe that having a seat at the table where decisions are being made that could impact our campus culture contributes to the positive morale among staff, which in turn benefits our student success. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So thank you so much. Do, do we have questions? Anyone have questions for Mickey and Louise? Could I give an example? Yes. Yes, but this, this is not in my remarks this afternoon, but I thought uh -huh. it might be helpful. So I attended a staff Senate meeting last week, and one of the senators said, could we improve communication about board action? And so one, one of the issues that, that uh, you approved at the last meeting was to expand the geographic range of the tuition benefit 250R so that we could have more um, attractiveness to students who are non-residents in the state of Tennessee. And so one of the senators said, this is a great idea, but we really are getting the calls on how to implement it, but the communication on how to do that has not been good. Oh. Wow, okay. So the next day I met with General Bailey and said, would you work on a communication plan to make sure that whatever we do in the senior leadership team, whatever board action there is, is, is something that filters where it needs to be so that those that we ask to implement really have the tools they need. Now, that might, th th it may be that the information is going out, but there's a stopping point somewhere, and we, we just have to find out where it is. Well, if that had not arisen, I wouldn't have known. We're working on a compensation plan where we move from across the board raises to merit, which has really um, been a, a topic of hot discussion on campus because they haven't done that in more than 20 years. And so Dr. Wadia, for, uh, representing the faculty, and Ms. Mitchell, uh, representing the, the staff, have asked me if we could work on a transition plan. So instead of going from nothing to all, we, we pull it in over a, a year and make sure that our evaluation instrument is appropriate. Okay, that seems reasonable, makes sense, we get more people on board. And so there are a lot of issues like that that are brought forward 
that we can talk about and we hear the perspective and can make better decisions. And sometimes the decision is, wow, I understand that it looks like that's not going to be popular uh, on campus, but there's a reason we still have to do it and we're going to do it. And we have the culture that our community will say, we don't like it, but we're going to do it because we know we have to do it and we're behind the university. So we, we all know what the roles are. But just as, as they said, the whole point is that we can make better decisions and better informed decisions when the people who are, have a stake in it are, are at the table and their voices are heard. And so I'm very appreciative. And I'll say one last thing. I've, shared governance is a tenet of university life. It works better here than any place I've ever been because we talk more, we talk more often, and sometimes we talk, talk heartily. <laughs> but it, it's because people really are communicating to get to the bottom of an issue with the university goals in mind. And so I'm very appreciative of these leaders and also the leaders that we've had every year. The leadership changes uh, mostly each year, and we've had outstanding presidents every year in, in both sides. And so thank you very much. I have a question. Louise, it sounds like you have been really busy this year. I've been very busy this year, yes, ma'am. I'm just curious to know if you could think of one of your most proudest or proudest achievements of working with this uh, Senate. What would that be? Sure. Um, I really appreciate um, staff appreciation. Um, I know that um, staff really work very hard, tirelessly for our students. Mm -hmm. And we take a week out of the year. Um, I've been in Staff Senate now almost three years. And every um, year we um, we have this tradition where we take the time to be thankful for each other. Um, and I really value and I love how we come together to show how much we um, appreciate each other, how much we work together and that we make a difference. And so we do some fun events. Um, we get to um, write cards where uh, we send to all our different um, staff members and, and, and articulate how thankful we are and how they've um, impacted students and, and just really um, things that they've done for each other. And um, I also, um, we uh, do an ice cream social. We um, just come together and just honor each other and all the good work that we do. Um, that's part of it. And also, um, recently we did, um, I guess this is how, how staff members come together, I guess, in, in camaraderie. We um, just last minute put together a week where we participated alongside the students for homecoming week. Obviously, we're not the students, so I think we were feeling a little left out. So um, it was suggested to, you know, just to, to get involved. And so we did a costume contest. We <laughs> we did a door contest. We did all these different contests. And uh, there was a lot of um, participation in the staff, just not necessarily in staff senate, but all these uh, staff members that normally aren't, you know, part of it. And I think that um, participating alongside the students really boosted morale and just continuing that type of environment. Um, just seeing, I was really a surprise of the involvement and that they enjoyed it. And we just, it's just, it's just really nice. So I'm really proud of us coming together and Awesome. Sounds like you've really done a lot to promote just a great quality of life on campus. Yes. And so that is very meaningful. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's it. We, we talked about having a break. Is there any other business for these two? Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. We will have a short, short break here. Let's have a short break because it's only, it's less, not even 9.30, so short five-minute break. Welcome back. For the next part of our meeting, I'd like to recognize Trustee Jenkins, Chair of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting yesterday. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from yesterday's Academic Programs and Policies Student Life Board Committee meeting. The committee reviewed the following items. Provost Gandhi informed the university's intent to submit a letter of notification 
to the Tennessee Higher Education Committee to establish a Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology. Provost Gandhi also provided the fall census enrollment data. Uh, the committee reviewed and approved the following action items. Policy 2.038, undergraduate and graduate admissions. Policy 2.010, undergraduate and graduate academic retention standards. The above items were included, included in your consent agenda at the beginning of today's meeting. That concludes my report, and I move that the board approve the minutes of the November 29th Academic Programs and Policies Student Life Board Committee as written. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? I'd just like to uh, point out something about the policies mm -hmm. that were approved. Both of those were um, uh, designed to uh, give the, the same uh, con careful consideration to uh, some issues regarding our graduate students, our graduate program that we've always given to our, our undergraduate program. And the fact that uh, it was noticed, I think, that that needed to be done uh, is uh, a testament to the fact that our graduate programs are growing under the leadership of Dr. Chad Brooks that we heard from last time and the rest of our deans and department chairs in those in those programs. And so uh, I just wanted to uh, to state that in terms of the the context of the of the policies, uh, uh, it, it looks like just you know a lot of uh, 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 technical language and changes in the lines and that sort of thing, but it really reflects uh, uh, a growing uh, 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 graduate program, which is is part of the strategic plan. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Trustee Reverend, and congratulations for record enrollment to everyone. That's fantastic. Well, that's great. Uh, we have uh, 10,954 students at Austin P. Uh, that beat our previous record for 2011. Our enrollment is up 4.7%, and our enrollment was up uh, more than any other college in Tennessee. So let's, let's give them a hand. Great job. Good job. <laughs> any more conversation about the minutes from this meeting yesterday? We have, t we have a motion. All in favor of approving the minutes from yesterday, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. As chair of the audit committee meeting, I'll be giving the report on the committee meeting yesterday. The audit committee meeting yesterday, we listened to presentations on the following items. We listened to the internal audit reports released from August 21st, 2018 through November 6th, 2018, along with a list of outstanding audit recommendations. We listened to the results of the quality assessment review from the Office of Internal Audit. We also listened to the Internal Audit Client Satisfaction Survey results for fall 2018. We also listened to Judy Molnar discuss the information technology risks. Um, she's the Associate Vice President and Chief Information Officer. This concludes my report, and I move that we accept the minutes of the Audit Committee meeting held yesterday, November 29th, 2018. Second. Is there any discussion about the minutes from the meeting yesterday? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The minutes are approved. Next, I'd like to recognize Trustee Atkins. Chair of the Business and Finance Committee to give us a report of their committee meeting yesterday. Thanks, Mr. Ganada. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to present my report from yesterday's Business and Finance Committee meeting. The committee reviewed and approved the following action items. A, consideration of the October revised budget for fiscal year 2018-2019. B, consideration of revisions to policy 1.021 for 
fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments. And C, consideration of factors for the tuition and mandatory fee increases. These items will be presented for your review and action in a few minutes. The committee reviewed the following information items. A, from Tennessee Higher Education Commission recommendations. At the fall quarterly THEC meeting, recommendations are made for state appropriations, capital projects, and student fees. These recommendations are presented to the governor for consideration. The preliminary information was shared with the committee. The Tennessee Higher Education Financial Stress Test Results. The THEC staff requested each university and the community college sector to complete a two-fold approach to gauge the institutional financial stress. These results of the assessment were shared with the committee. That concludes my report, and I move that the board approve the minutes from the November 29th Business Finance Committee meeting as written. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion about the minutes from yesterday? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The minutes are approved from yesterday. Okay. Trust. Uh, consideration of the October revised budget for fiscal year 2018-2019. You have before you a copy of the October revised budget for fiscal year 2018-2019. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the October revised budget for the fiscal year 2018-19 as written. Do we have a second? We have any discussion on the revised budget for fiscal year 2018-2019? Hearing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. You, you have before you a Bill, copy. Bill, uh, Trustee, excuse I'm me sorry. one second. I believe we need to take a roll call. Yes. Okay, Secretary, uh, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Canada. Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Now, you also have before you a copy of the revisions to policy 1.021, which covers fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the revisions to policy 1.021, for fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments as written. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The fees, charges, and refund adjustment policy has been approved. All right. You also have before you a copy of the factors for tuition and mandatory fee increases. And by direction of the committee, I move to approve the factors for tuition and mandatory fee increases as written. Second. Is there any discussion? Um, I'll just point out that this is in response to uh, direction from the legislature that uh, we develop such a policy. Okay, there's, and, and that was the purpose for that. Thank you, Trustee Rayburn. Any more discussion on the tuition and mandatory fee increases? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. And all opposed? No. The consideration of factors for the mandatory fee increase has been approved. Next on our agenda is the report of the executive committee meeting yesterday. Thank you for the opportunity to present this report. Yesterday, the committee reviewed the results of the board evaluation, which is required by I hope I can get this right, S-A-C-S-C-O-C, -S -C -C, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. That's a tongue twister. The results are in your meeting materials. They're in under the Executive Committee tab, A. Do 
just just as a just to give a little bit of background, thank you all for taking the time to complete this assessment. This was our own self assessment created by the Board of Trustees. You'll see that, do you? I think everybody has it. Tab D1. Danelle is telling me it's dab, tab D2. This assessment includes several questions, many questions that we asked of, of ourselves um, on how we can improve as a board. By and large, uh, of the 20 or so questions, the majority were significantly positive. There were a few things that looks like we can improve, and I'd just like to, to call out some questions and have some open dialogue on uh, things we can do. In particular, if I want to point out one question, was the board takes regular steps to keep informed about important trends in the larger environment that might affect the organization. And it was the one question where we had the most disagree response, the least positive response. So I'm just going to open the floor up. Any conversation about how we can improve as a board and as a group to serve the um, school better? Let me ask it a different way. What can we do, or can't? Does anybody have a suggestion? What could we do to improve anything about our board? Not only how we stay involved. Um, there are other questions in here that there are some comments. Let's go to the comment section. Uh, again, I just like to make sure I feel like we are doing an, an awesome job. How can we keep getting better? It is important for us as a group to keep getting better. So uh, comments, what are the weaknesses of the board? Uh, we're still learning. Someone said this is not necessarily a weakness, but uh, we could be more active versus passive. So is there anything you all would like to see, anything that comes to mind that we could do better as a board? This yes, is not Rayburn. quite what you asked for. Mm -hmm. um, but just to get it out there, uh, if any board member would like to see something on the agenda, mm -hmm. then it's it's permissible to contact Danielle and ask that it be that it be placed on the agenda, right? That that's uh, absolutely okay. Mm -hmm. So so um, we, uh, uh, I guess it was at the last meeting. We got a, a very helpful sheet of the things that we have to do every every month, but there might be other things that would moving forward occur to people. And so I just want to want to uh, uh, get it out there that if there's something that anybody thinks that mm -hmm. would be appropriate for discussion on the agenda, that that that's something that could be uh, could be arranged. One one thing I think that that has affected things to a great degree so far is that so much of what we did in the beginning was logistical kinds of things that had to be done just mm -hmm. to get us established, and and that's done that mm -hmm. that's accomplished, and so there's time now that. We can have more discussions of things that that might be on the minds of board members. I think. Thank you. I think it would be interesting if we had on a monthly basis uh, somebody give us uh, an overview of really what went on on campus on a monthly basis. Uh, you, you have you have lots of uh, speakers that come in here. You have a lot of things for students that we as a board, you know, we, we come to the meetings and we support Austin P, but we may not know the intimate things going on at Austin P. If we had so, just a, you know, just a, a summary of what went on for the month to keep us abreast of current trends on campus, I think that would be very effective for all of us. Do we have something? I think Bill Persinger sent out something like that. I don't know if that's in an email. 
I mean, I think um, when he sends out our emails each week, they are um, headlines that Austin P has been in, um, mm-hmm. in print and in and online. Um, that's what we get each week. But I definitely agree with um, Mr. Jenkins. I feel like we, um, I feel like I, I think the board really needs to hear about more specific things happening on campus to really get the student voice and the student um, perspective on campus. Um, granted, yes, I know we're very, you know, detached and everybody has full-time jobs and everybody's, you know, doing their own thing every day. But um, I really think students need to see what, what this is really about. And I think having them at least, or having somebody come in to just have a voice to talk about what they've done as a student on campus or as somebody on campus, I think that would be very beneficial to the board. Would you also um, benefit from getting national information about national trends or regional trends, or would you want it just more concentrated on the university? Well, we're getting a lot of additional publications that we okay. do, like I, we share governance and whatnot, uh, and we, we certainly look at those, but uh, it would be nice to know what your perspective is on these national issues okay. that are coming up, not just the, the issue in the Um, I also think uh, just as a as a student that's been on the board and that has um, gone on through Austin P as being on multiple committees, multiple jobs, multiple opportunities and having a lot of those responsibilities. Um, I know that this is like a, a, a state mandate and everything, but I really think that um, student interest would rise if they had the opportunity to vote on the board. Any other comments, suggestions, President White, any thoughts? Well, I, I had a suggestion, mm-hmm. and I think uh, Mr. Jenkins' comment kind of changed my perspective on it. But as I mentioned yesterday in the committee meetings, I read, before I come into the office every morning, I read Inside Higher Education, I read University Business, and I read the Chronicle of Higher Education Digest. I also get publications uh, and notes from the American Council of Education and American Association of State Colleges and Universities. And so I was thinking, oh, you know, you might want to sign up for these, but I'm assuming you have other work to do. But what I could, what I can do <laughs> is, is as we prepare that information, because some of the student work would need to come from student affairs, because frankly, I, I'm, we've got so many students doing so many different things I don't even know what it all is. I just look at my calendar, see what I can get to on any particular day. But we've got things going on from the academic side, things from the student affairs side, things from the athletic side. And so we could put some of that together and then maybe as part of that do kind of a recap. And this I will address some of this in my comments in a few minutes, but uh, address some of the topics that are being discussed because typically if they're being discussed in the national publications, it's because they're a risk. And so we could put that in, and then you could look at that and say, I'd like more information on that in terms of the future of Austin P. or have you planned for that? So it might be a way to give you some ideas of things that you want to, to have a deeper dive into later. Would that be helpful? Uh, fantastic. I think that Dr. Wadia said it great this morning when he mentioned uh, taking proactive engagement or being proactively engaged, and I feel like our board may be the strongest board in Tennessee. Of course. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't still improve and have great, robust conversations about how to get better. So that concludes my report of the executive committee meeting yesterday. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. And a second? Second. It's been moved and approved that we adopt the minutes from the executive committee meeting. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? At this time, I'd like to recognize President White to give her report and also report on any interim items. Thank you, Vice Chair Canato. So this morning, you heard from our Faculty Senate President, uh, Dr. Mickey Wadia, and our Staff Senate President, Ms. Louise Mitchell, and I asked them to speak on each 
of their roles in shared governance in Austin P because and uh, you do get the publication from AGB um, and that's what kind of made me think about having them here today because the summer issue really centered on shared governance and my remarks today will center on the importance of shared governance based on a, a comment that I heard from one of my dear friends. She's the president emerita of California State University, Northridge. And she said, leadership is collective strength used strategically. And my campus community knows I quote that every single convocation I have since my very first day, um, my very first convocation at Austin P. because I really believe it. Leadership is collective strength used strategically. So we are stronger together, and I'm grateful for the work of our faculty and our staff. Now, students also have a role in shared governance through the Student Government Association. And so I meet with the president of the Staff Senate regularly, the president of the uh, Faculty Senate regularly, and the president of the Student Government Association regularly. And each of those leaders has access to all of, of the senior leadership team. So if they have a question on finance, they go see uh, Vice President for Finance and Administration, Mitch Robinson. If they have a question about what's happening in public relations or branding, they go see Vice President for External Affairs, Ron Bailey. And, and of course, they have a they work hand in glove with Vice President for Student Affairs, uh, Greg Singleton. So, th so they have access to academic affairs and uh, all of our leaders on campus. But today, I want to I want to focus on the faculty and the staff, and, and one of the reasons is because they are, um, there is more continuity. We, we tend to start over each year with student government because there's a great deal of variability depending on who the student government president is. And so most of the time, it's, it's really good and engaging, and then sometimes you might have a president who is not as engaged. But the faculty senate and the staff senate are pretty, uh, pretty consistent. So in this context, shared governance is a set of practices by which faculty and staff participate in significant decisions. And so I wanted to go way back. I'm still a professor at heart. So the concept can be traced back to the time European universities began. So if you go back to Bologna and Oxford and Paris, they started as guilds of students and faculty or masters nearly a thousand years ago. So this is not some politically new thing on the horizon, but the institutions then were self-regulating, and the reason is because these are the experts in their fields. The system of shared governance was brought to the United States after the Civil War, and there was a little bit of, of kind of back and forth until World War II. What had happened is a lot of faculty here went to study in Europe, and they saw how this worked in Europe and brought back that concept to the United States. So they really pushed for it. In 1966, there was a statement on government of colleges and universities that was released by a number of higher education associations, including AGB that you've worked with quite a bit. So that statement shapes what governance is and whose role it is to do what. And Dr. Wadia was right, even if it's not my primary role, I have some influence on certain things. And even if it's not the faculty's primary role, they have some influence on things. And what, and what I like to, to use as my example is, you know, if, if you look at the intellectual capital, there's more concentrated on this campus than in much of, of Middle Tennessee because you've got these ridiculously accomplished experts. And why would we not ask them to use their expertise. I get tickled sometimes because the faculty can go consult and make a lot of money because their opinion matters. So if they're consulting and their opinion matters to somebody else, why aren't we asking their opinions? Because I get it for free. So that's, you know, that's, that's important to me. So shared governance done well strengthens the quality of leadership and strategic decision making. And so one of the things I like the best about our system here is we communicate all the time. They have my cell phone number. I have their cell phone number. So just as you don't like to be surprised and I try to let you know in advance if something's coming up, if I, if I hear something or I'm concerned about something, I will call or text Dr. Wadia. I will call or text Louise Mitchell. If they hear something and they say, hey, did you know this or hey, are you aware of this or I heard this rumor, is this true? And a lot of times it's not true. Um, or maybe there's a kernel of truth but some, some misinformation. They don't wait and have a meeting and vote some censure, they pick up the phone and say, what's going on? And then we talk about it, and then nobody is surprised. And we can be proactive and make sure that we are, are making the best decisions 
that we can. Now, we don't always agree, but we have agreed principally and operationally that Austin P students come first. We have agreed not to work in an environment of gotcha. And I have been in some campuses where that's not always the case. And so I like the fact that the people who come to the table are there to solve a solution or to create a solution to a problem, not to just say, okay, that, that didn't work well. So I really am, am pleased with the way we work together. So the curriculum does rest with the faculty. They, they know what the trends are. And we, we ask our faculty to stay involved in industry. We ask them to conduct cutting-edge research in their fields. So they have a lot to say about the curriculum. But we have to fund it. You have to fund it. So the bottom line, after, after they come up with these great ideas, we have to figure out, is it feasible? Provost Gandhi works with Hanover Research a lot and other research firms to do feasibility studies. What would it cost? Who benefits? Where are the students who would be uh, attracted to this particular curriculum or this, this degree? You know, what's the, what's the outlook for the graduates? And so there's an idea, there's a trend, there's an expert, then there is a person who's at the table who's gonna say, this is feasible for us, or it might even be, this is great, but this is a, a, a better priority right now given the university as a whole. So both of us have a, a piece at the table or place at the table. Now, ultimately, curriculum starts with faculty, but actually the decisions on curriculum rest with you. You are the ultimate authority here. So, so when we talk about shared governance, obviously the board has a role. And so by statute, all authority to govern rests with you. And the, and the FOCUS Act specifies Management and governance of each state institution or university shall be vested in the institution's respective state university board, subject to certain powers retained by THEC. But then you delegate authority and responsibility to various groups on campus. And again, quoting from the FOCUS Act, it says, boards assume general responsibility for the operation, delegating to the chief executive officer such powers and duties as are necessary and appropriate for efficient administration. Now, delegation is also important to SAC COC. So Vice Chair uh, Kanata was talking about the, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. Why are they important? Because they are our regional accreditor. Why does that matter? If, if they put us on warning because of inappropriate governance or anything else, and put us, you know, they would put us on warning and then put us on probation, and then, and then in some cases we lose our accreditation, our students cannot get federal financial aid. So the minute that happens, we're out of business. So we have to listen to what they say. And there is a fight, actually, in, with some of the, the um, state institutions in the South, uh, because they, uh, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools handles Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and then all the way over to Texas, um, but there is some disagreement between boards and legislatures and universities about who takes what role. And some states, and I'm thinking of one that I won't mention out loud right now, but there is, there is a state right now where there is a letter on file from Southern Association that says you, you need to, to make sure you're in the right lane or you're at risk for losing federal funding. So that's really important. So what they say is the board should ensure a clear and appropriate distinction between the policy-making function of the board and the responsibility of the administration and the faculty to administer and implement policy. And I mention that because they don't just say the responsibility of the administration to administer policy. They say the responsibility of the administration and the faculty. So SAC-COC specifies the role that faculty have specifically to govern uh, the institution. So both of the faculty and staff senates have led initiatives that have made us better. So one uh, we talked about this morning was, was the issue on how we're going to transition to a merit pay system. That's been really important to me since I got here because I've never been anywhere where we didn't operate on a full merit system. I didn't push it four years ago because when our people are not even making close to what they're supposed to be making, what's the point? At that, I mean, we need to get them where they're supposed to be, and then let's implement a merit system and say those who are, are rock stars should be uh, compensated better. Those who are doing their job should also participate in merit. And then, if, you know, frankly, there should be an incentive to do better. So if you're not 
one who's who's appropriately engaged in work, then there won't be as much of a participation in merit. And we've always had a system whereby someone who, who doesn't get an acceptable evaluation doesn't get anything. That's always been. So that's just the way it works. But how we implement it really affects our campus, and it, imp- it impacts campus morale. So faculty and staff have been involved in that. Both Senates together worked on a parental uh, leave policy, and that was just approved by the state last month. And I'm, I'm thrilled to say that this will help us attract and retain colleagues who are, are concerned about taking care of their families while they're working at the institution. So that was a joint project from the Faculty Senate uh, representation and the Staff Senate representation. Um, we have instituted a more robust faculty evaluation process, and the Faculty Senate was leading in that. And, it, and, were, and were they comfortable doing it? I don't think so. Was it an easy thing to do? It was not. But they did the heavy lifting to find something that was, a, 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 was really amenable and okay with the administration, and also they could negotiate with the faculty. So they took a leadership role in what was a pretty complicated um, process. The faculty staff, uh, the faculty senate also created a faculty senate staff award. And Dr. Wadia wanted to make sure I mentioned that because he wants it clear that the faculty understand what the staff bring to the table. And it's part of that appreciation for what people do to make it a better place. The Staff Senate, uh, in partnership with the Office of Campus Sustainability, created the Green Office Campaign. That's, that entices offices to go green and become more responsible users of resources. Uh, the Staff Senate weighs in on issues such as workplace safety, wellness initiatives and benefits, and all of those advance the university. And then also the Staff Senate developed a robust inst- uh, evaluation tool for the staff. We already had an evaluation tool but it it wasn't asking the right questions. And so the staff senate worked with HR to try to figure out a better way to really assess performance that can be rewarded. And and part of this is for formative evaluation. So what I want from you all is what you expect of me, how you want me to improve. You know, I like like the Atta Girls. Oh, yeah, good job. Keep doing that. But I'm concerned about this. Can you do so and this so? And could, would you think about this? Or, or we want you to work on that. Well, if I know what you want, I, I'm going to achieve it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very competitive. I'm going to overachieve it. <laughs> I know, right? But our employees are the same. They want to know what the expectations are. And they want to know how they can excel. So this evaluation tool gives them more formative feedback. So they know what the expectations are and so that they can, they can really meet those and, and be the overachievers that they already are too. So a lot of the, the relationship, though, is built on trust. And, and as Dr. Wadia mentioned this morning, trust is earned. It's not just because somebody is sitting in a seat. And you can't develop trust if you don't have the conversations. And again, some of those conversations are difficult to have But we are in an environment where it's okay to have them, and I really do appreciate that. So I wanted to kind of illustrate that just just by saying what our employees do on behalf of students. So you know that our faculty teach. Many of you are alumni or your family members went here, and you know the direct impact that the faculty has on the student. And it's not just teaching. It's developing a relationship. It's advising. It's helping with recommendations. I'm still writing recommendations for students that I had 20 years ago. I hope I still remember them as I get older. But right now, I, I just say, oh, yes, I remember you. Send me, send me what you've done. But I'm st- that relationship was built many, many years ago. Our faculty do that all the time. They help the students get internships. They help them get jobs. They help them get into graduate school. So they relate to them. But we also have staff who are directly involved with the life of the student every day. So our cashiers help the students pay and confirm their classes. Our physical plant, which is the very best in the state, and and I want to say one reason, not, not just are these folks fabulous electricians and plumbers and and painters and craftspeople. I mean, they they are not these are experts at what they do. But then we also have our landscapers. Our, our director there is a horticulturist. He's not, he, you know, he doesn't have people who mow the grass. He has people 
who manicure this fabulous plant. So that matters to parents. It matters to students. And so they keep our campus gorgeous, and they keep it functioning. And our student affairs employees, they are everywhere all the time, and they make our students feel safe. They make our students feel welcome. They make them feel included. They make them feel like somebody is noticing their lives even outside the classroom. And, of course, our public, I have to give kudos to the public safety. They were here for a spotlight a, a few months ago. But we have a public safety department that also doesn't have a gotcha mentality. They, they hold the peace. They make sure that people conform. But they understand that they are supposed to be walking around campus and being resources for students and faculty and staff. And I, and I just appreciate, appreciate that. So I want to highlight the work of one group, and that's our enrollment management team. Every single student who walks on this campus or takes a class online has to go through our en enrollment management team. That starts with the Office of Admissions. I can't even tell you the volume of work that they do. Because when you're talking about recruiting students, you've got to recruit. You've got to touch thousands. Rex, do you know what our, our Provost Gandy, what is our, our current rate? So do we, if we touch 10 students, how many will come here? Is it four? Last year, uh, we had about 12,000 uh, applications. And out of that, we did 2,000. And so, but, but you have to have the 12,000. And they have to be processed. And then they have to be offered and admitted, and then they have to decide to enroll, and someone touches them at every process. Our recruiters visit high schools across the state telling the story, and faculty also go with them. They, they don't, they're not everywhere, but they have volunteered, and they do go out. I think, is Dee Jones here? How many high schools have you been to this year? So he's gone to, to all but two high schools in the county, uh, dean of the College of Arts and Letters, Getting kids excited about Austin P. Now, he's self-serving. He's getting them excited about the departments in the College of Arts and Letters, right? <laughs> but he's out there with our students. You know, admission staff evaluate test scores. They evaluate high school transcripts, college transcripts, and the ever-challenging military transcript. Oh, my gosh. And so we have people who look at every piece of paper – our financial aid officers advise students in, about scholarships and federal aid. In the last 10 months, not counting November, December, still coming, they had more than 30,000 calls. And many people are upset when they call. 30,000. And we'll, we'll very, very quickly surpass that. More than 8,000 of our students received financial aid this fall. And a lot of times our financial aid counselors are not in control of what happens. They are having to implement federal policy, which, as you know, this year was a nightmare for our veteran students because of issues with the VA. Well, they're going to call the, our VA office, but they're also calling financial aid. So these folks are accountants and counselors and huggers. And, oh, my gosh, there's one more phone call. I mean, they are front lines. And so... We have the highest percentage of Pell-eligible students in the state, which means it's tougher to get them in and through because their paperwork is more complicated. So, Mr. Atkins, it's like somebody, you know, you can do a loan for just about anybody, but there are some who take a lot more time. We have a lot of those students on campus. <laughs> Probably to us, right? So our, our staff members are experts, and I will tell you, I am not an expert in financial aid, and, I, and you don't want me to be. The regulations change about every 30 seconds. We have to hire the best, and we have to make sure they get the professional development they need, and then we have to let them do their jobs because they're the ones who can keep us out of trouble. That's how I feel with our, our, our athletics directors here, Gerald Harrison, and he knows that I don't know NCAA regulations. It is up to me to stay out of his way and his team's way, and it's up to him to say, oh, you can't do that, President White. And he is very quick to do that. So that's really, really good. But they are experts in their, in their fields. And so I just want to give a quick update. All these folks I've been talking about, they touch the lives of our nearly 11,000 students. Almost every one of them in some way. And yes, I did say nearly 11,000 students. 
Although Tennessee universities averaged a 0.3% loss in headcount over the last three years, we had a 4.7% increase. That is eight times. That's right. Yeah. That's so cool. And actually, the mathematician would say eight times a loss is not. No, so go the other way. Go the other way. I, I, I caught that after I wrote it. But we are the only locally governed institution to experience an increase in enrollment. And I, I just say, I said this yesterday, but kudos to Provost Gandy and the entire enrollment management team and the faculty and the staff who show up. Because this is not just open the door, send them an announcement, and let them come. This is like hewing rock. I mean, it, it is challenging to do this in this environment. I'm also really proud of our advancement team and um, we'll be gearing up, I, I just give you a preview, we'll be gearing up for a comprehensive campaign soon. So we're gonna be asking for money. We're gonna be asking you to help us ask for money and we're gonna be asking you for money. I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, so if you don't take my, if, I, if suddenly there's a block, I'll know, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. A call has become, has been blocked. But I'm excited because I looked at the fundraising totals over the last 10 years, and I looked. I tossed the year with the lowest data and or the lowest total. That was in 2008 and 9. We had just under two and a half million, and then I tossed the year with the highest total. That was 2012-13, just over 17 million. When Mr. Erickson gave his wife's estate to the university when she passed. So if you take out the lowest and the highest, and you average the other eight years, you've got 6.6 .6 million dollars. Over the last four years, our average was 8.28 million, with a total of 9.865 million last year. And we are already up this year compared to where we were last year. And so I'm very excited about that. I'm excited that that I, I really believe our, our supporters, our community, our alumni will catch the vision of where we are and want to jump in to support. So I'll ask and I'll answer any questions you have, but I have a question for you first, and I, I just want to respond to the board's uh, evaluation, uh, uh, the self-evaluation. So you've been at the helm almost two years, and we've been showcasing various aspects of the university, which we'll continue to do. But I'd like to start a conversation with you about how you want to be made aware of issues that carry inherent risk. And, and I've gotten some ideas from you this morning, and so I'm, I may have already gotten the answer to the question. But, you know, your audit committee hears reports every quarter on risks that the university could be confronting. Yesterday, you looked at the risk footprint. You heard a report from IT on the IT risk footprint. Um, new issues are springing up around the country that I thought you might have an interest in exploring. Now, I've been in higher ed a long time, and I think I know a lot. Ask Elliot. I tell him all the time. What scares me is what I don't know. What worries me is what isn't even on my radar that I should know that could be out there that, that we're just trying to monitor and watch because we don't know everything. And just when you think you've kind of seen it all, there's something else that will happen. So a large, this is just an example, a large public university in the Northeast was recently in the news because of a lack of control over athletics that resulted in the death of a student athlete. This was a football player who got sick and was pushed and, and died. So you've got a kid who's dead and a family devastated and a university on the hook. The director of athletics and the coach were fired. The president has announced his resignation, his retirement. One of the most respected presidents in the nation has been at odds with the board over this issue. The chairman of the board resigned. It's a mess, and that university will be dealing with the mess for years. Sunday, the retired president of a large, respected university in the Midwest was arrested. Again, one of the most respected academic leaders in higher ed for decades, was a provost for many years, was a president for many years, and this was a very large research university. She was arrested and charged for lying to investigators who were trying to get to the bottom of claims that a campus doctor sexually abused students over a period of years. And these were students in the gymnastics program. You may have read about that. That doctor is in prison today and will be in prison for the rest of his life. But then Sunday, the president was arrested. Three years ago, another Midwestern university was in the news because of discord over race relations, benefits, and a lack of confidence in campus leadership. 
And as a result, the president and the chancellor of the campus and the system were forced out. Enrollment in that university fell by 30%. This year was the first year I believe they've had any uptick in that uh, whole debacle. So overseeing campus operations is my responsibility, and I'm thankful for the relationship we have. I can call you, you can call me, and I try to do that if I think there is something that's pressing or could be a risk at the university. But I want to make sure you're seeing the things you want to see, and I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to discuss what you want to discuss. And that could be in some of the committees that you always have the day before. You could decide if you, know, if you want that discussion in the committee. You could decide you want that discussion maybe at this point in the agenda where we conclude um, with, with a robust discussion. Uh, or it could be any other time, maybe first, maybe after showcase. So you can think about that. But to that end, if you have discussions today about things that you'd like to hear, either today or let me think about some things and compile some things and bring them back to you, um, I'm happy to discuss today or bring some things back. And so what you just do is, is send your ideas to Danielle or me or to related Cheryl O'Malley. And I'll, I'll reiterate, reiterate what Dr. Uh, Rayburn said. The, the actual, the person who has the control over the agenda is the chair. So when things come here to Danelle, then Danelle has a conversation with Chair O'Malley. And then, but I can't imagine that Chair O'Malley or the chair would ever say, no, that's not appropriate for a board meeting. I would, I would expect that you have the relationship that that would come. But if there's anything you want to discuss, then send it to me or to Chair O'Malley or to uh, Danelle, and we'll make sure that we have that uh, discussion and, and, or that presentation to you. And so, is there anything you'd like to propose for discussion, or do you have any questions about my report? I have a couple of thoughts. Sure. Uh, thank you, President White. That just was uh, eye-opening. In light of the what's in the media, my, this is my personal view, just to share with the board. The media will talk about the 0.1% of negative things that happen, and we need to be aware of that. As a group, we need to be prepared. I believe that the culture of openness, the culture of safety, the culture of it's okay to talk about issues inherently prevents issues like this. And so I feel like our culture is um, on the right track. As I was listening to you speak, I just wrote down a couple notes that might be helpful going forward in my mind. I love to study really successful entities. And so we can look at the 0.1% of schools that has had issues. We can also look at the 99% of 99% of schools that are doing things really well, maybe even, I hate to say it, maybe even better than we do. Sure. Um, I would like for us to really study how we can continue to grow and get better. In that light, I've been thinking, as you spoke, about happy students create happier, uh, more en enrollment, bigger enrollment, and things that affect that are like the faculty evaluations. Somebody mentioned the faculty evaluations, that might be kind of cool just to see a couple of those. We don't need the names on them, but to see some actual faculty evaluations for what they're being um, evaluated on. Uh, um, uh, one more thing that I was very interested in is career services, thinking about students that come here and graduate. I'd just be kind of curious to know where they end up, where they're going. Um, that might be a topic for a future meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. I don't have any concerns about the risk other than I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you. I'll follow up for just a second on uh, on my previous comments. I thought of a few things. <laughs> other things. <laughs> um, I think I just I want to emphasize that um, uh, I, I, I'm a short termer here. I have. Uh, 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 we're coming up on my last semester, but uh, uh, moving moving forward, I think um, everybody on this board uh, is uh, understands 
that. Uh, it's not the board's uh, job to, as do, uh, Dr. White says, get in the weeds and run the university and that that's inappropriate. I don't think anybody on this board is inclined to do that. Um, I think you you're, uh, 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 have, have a, a lot better judgment than that and, and you understand uh, 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 where, where your abilities can can be most useful, but I, I would emphasize that it's okay to be inquisitive, and asking a question doesn't mean that you're confronting anybody. Um, uh, uh, it's it's probably a good idea if you want a lot of detailed information from Provost Gandhi to give him a heads up so that he can he can prepare that just as a an example. But um, I uh, I thought of a couple of specific examples, and I'm I, I'm uh, a little nervous about mentioning them because I don't want anybody to think oh she thinks there's a problem there. I do not. Uh, the, one, one of the things that uh, keeps me from, uh, uh, tr- uh, hel- helps me uh, try to avoid opening my mouth more than I should is I am very aware of the public nature of these meetings and the fact that sometimes if you're not careful about what you say, it can be misunderstood. And, and I don't want to be misunderstood, so I want to be careful, you know. But... Um, for instance, uh, uh, I gave kudos earlier to uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Brooks and to our deans and department chairs for the growth in graduate programs and, and uh, uh, graduate programs in, in, uh, in my building have grown t- uh, tremendously, and I think it's a very positive thing. There are concerns on, on campus about that. Uh, uh, people have talked to me about... Uh, uh, it, it, and I, do, I don't think it's uh, I don't think faculty don't want our graduate programs to grow. I don't think it's that at all. I think they're they're, con- they're concerned that um, we've got to be careful as we put emphasis on our graduate programs not to lose that um, very uh, that emphasis on a, on very personalized attention that we give our undergraduates. Okay, so uh, as you as you hear things like our graduate programs are growing and you're going to hear that they're growing more questions you can ask as board members what measures do you have in place to ensure that we continue to support uh, in a very uh, in a very intimate and concerned way our undergraduate students because that's something special about Austin P I think most places on this campus undergraduates get more attention more individual attention from faculty and staff than they do in many, many other co- colleges, even some colleges that are probably smarter, s- smaller than we are. And so we don't want to lose that. So you, when, you, when you hear the graduate program is going, it's okay to ask Dr. White and, and her team, what are you doing to make sure that we don't erode the services that we're providing to our undergraduates? We have had, uh, so that's example one. Example two, we have had um, uh, wonderful improvements in the success of our athletic programs, and those are very obvious things and very good for the university, very good for the students, and and a very positive thing. And we haven't always had that. But one thing we've always had is a commitment to academic integrity where our uh, student uh, uh, athletes were concerned. I've been here a long time. I've never had a coach or anybody ask me to do anything inappropriate academically in regard to an athlete, and I don't know of any. If, if that has ever happened, I am completely in ignorance of it, okay? And, and uh, so a question you can ask. And, and, and that I think you, maybe you should, 
is as we increase our success in these academic programs, what measures are in place to be sure that we don't erode our commitment to academic integrity. And those are just a couple of a couple of examples. So I guess what I would say to the board moving forward in terms of the self-evaluation and the, the comments about uh, uh, shared governance and that sort of thing is it's okay to be inquisitive. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Have we, um, I know, I, know uh, I spoke briefly with Dr. Gandhi yesterday regarding, um, you know, the establishment of a new program. But do boards as a general nature, since I'm a novice at this, on universities, get engaged with environmental scan of, not that everything's local, but to look at things that are improving in the Clarksville, Montgomery County, Nashville metropolitan area and how it relates to the university and have those types of presentations. I know we have connectivity with members of the board because we have a very diverse group of people that are involved in the industrial board and, and things of that nature, but that, that we have those open discussions about that environmental scan and how we look at changing maybe the strategic direction or vision based on things we're seeing so we're more proactive than, than reactive to something. I'd love to jump in there. So um, what Provost Candy said yesterday in the committee meetings referred to our work with the language, uh, Korean language, Japanese language, and having our um, colleagues at other uh, institutions, primarily Clarksville, uh, Montgomery County School System, and then uh, leaders from Hankook and LG uh, cooperate with, with the university. And, and we're also in discussions with Google. Um, they supported a coding camp here in the summer. But one of the things that happened about two months ago uh, was a summit. It was an economic summit that included city and county leaders and business people, people from the Industrial Development Board, the Economic Development uh, Council, from the Chamber of Commerce, from the school system. And then we also invited um, colleagues from Nashville State Community College, uh, Tennessee College of Applied Technology, Hopkinsville Community College. And, and we invited everyone to the table. People were here from Google, people here from, from uh, New Jersey and from Atlanta, from LG. We had representatives from Hong Kong, and that was led by by uh, Dr. Meisch, uh, the Dean of the College of, of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, along with support from um, External Affairs. General Bailey uh, was part of that, and he's, he's actually carrying that initiative forward to do precisely what you're talking about. Now, we've been, what we're looking for um, are ways to make sure that we are proactive. One is to say, how can we spur economic development because then that's going to help our community. It's going to help our faculty and staff. It's going to help the, stu the students who are looking for jobs. It also helps make this a place that people can stay. So one of the things that I worry about, and I don't hear because Clark and Clarksville is just in a great spot, but I've been places where there were no jobs. So, so the, the students came to work here and then they left because they had to leave. And then you've got families split up and, and, and you don't you don't grow as not just a university, but you don't grow as a town because there's no opportunity. And so we want to be uh, partners and investors in that economic development. Some of it, though, is so some of it is some of it is being uh, responsive to what they say they need, making sure that we're putting out graduates who can participate. But the other side of it is being uh, not just not just being led, but leading. And so recently, I was at a meeting of the Industrial Development Board, and Dr. Hepner, who was here a little earlier today, he's the dean of the College of Business, um, gave a presentation to the um, Industrial Development, or actually it was to the EDC, I believe, but it, it was on economic opportunities here. And I called uh, the mayor's offices and, and just said, if you have not talked to Dean Hepner about opportunities for us and then also barriers to economic development in this region, you might want to do that. And I know that, that uh, that's happening um, in the next few weeks. So we're also trying to be thought leaders in that part. Now, the question for you is, is 
how much involvement would the board like to have? So for it, so we're doing things on campus. If you have ideas that could help guide those uh, initiatives and projects, I'd love to hear them. If you would just like a report on them, that's something we also could do in a showcase and, and just bring in some reports on what that activity is and what the results are. Um, but I think we're on the same page about what influence we could have as a steward of place. What, so what would you like to see? Well, I mean, I had, I had talked to you earlier because some of the work we were doing in the side of the arena in, in the state of Georgia and the, their board of regents, the Georgia University system, and, and some post-graduation kind of, it's not really internships, it's they go out and work and, and things like that. And it's, it's almost like a public-private partnership mm -hmm. to develop, um, you know, their, their cyber activity in Augusta. And, and across the state of Georgia, with with the with the military as well. Also. And and so it's just like when you find ideas like that, maybe maybe something could be presented and discussed, and is that a possibility? Uh, because everybody, but it probably because of where we all come from, probably run across ideas like that. That um, I don't know that we just tee it up maybe as an agenda item. I think it's a great idea, and and that is that's a point well taken. You obviously have interest in um, large complex labor organizations, you know, with your, with your work in staffing for the military, you've got context with other geographic regions that could be very helpful. You've obviously got the technology background. Don has talked to me before about how difficult it is to find technologists who really can keep up with the sophisticated um, requirements of, of automobiles, and I'm sure you're in the same, same situation, but you're also looking for people who can brand mm -hmm. and people who can make relationships. We've got financial planners, we've got bankers, we've got more military, we've got healthcare. And so, you know, we have people on this board who touch different things that we don't see. And so we can have the discussion here, but even more importantly is, is, if you have an idea, keep sending it because when I do, I hand it off and say, guys, look at this because there may be opportunities that we would never even think about, you know, that, that we need an opportunity to see. So we'll make sure that there is space for that. And it works the other way, and that's what I was getting at in the, in the environmental scan, the term of the environment here, what's needed? And then maybe somebody's got a great idea, and then maybe it does get transferred and handed off into the Right. And so we, we would show some gaps and you might have some, some contributions there. And then and so when we talk about strategic plan, uh, that's something that also came up in the board evaluation. One of the challenges that the board has had, maybe, is that we had just finished the, stu the strategic plan when you started. So it was, it, was, it was not even, the ink was not dry. Um, but we, ha we could not wait either because we were required by SAC COC to have a plan to replace the one that expired. And so you inherited a plan. And that doesn't mean, though, that the plan is set in stone. And one of the things that, that General Bailey's doing now, this year is the year to assess. This is our third year of the plan. Where are we? Now we, do a, we do a quick analysis each year. But where are we? Where do we uh, have some failures or some opportunities to get to improve? What hasn't really come to the forefront yet. So as we get that result, we also can bring that to the board and you look and say, you know, this makes sense, but we're not making progress here, but we don't think it's a priority. We'd like for you to look at this. And so there will be opportunities. We'll make sure you have them to influence the strategic direction because the plan was written for 10 years, but it's not a plan that cannot involve, evolve or should not evolve. It should evolve. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Uh, yes. I was yes. just going to mention it. You have to be really careful that you don't fix something that isn't broken. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've seen a lot of people run around fixing things that really are working pretty good. Uh, most of us here, I, I won't speak for everybody, but I think have been pretty successful at leading fairly important operations and numbers of people. And for me, I, I just tell you up front, I can I can spot a phony from max range. I really can. And I've 
you know, and most phonies, and what I mean by that is if this program is not running right, everybody in here I know, I know these people, they would, they could spot it. This program is running great from my viewpoint. So I just said keep doing what you're doing. And I would suggest that we should keep supporting you and giving you ideas and not getting into the minutia, but we should be working at the strategic level and uh, finding out who knows and let them handle just like those two great presentations we had this morning, dynamite. Why, w why would you go ahead and start feeling with that? But anyway, I'll just, it's a roundabout way of saying uh, I like what I see, and it's not because I'm stupid. I like what I see because <laughs> I, I've seen some things that are pretty stupid, and this one <laughs> that you're running is, is really first class. So just my two bits. Well said. Thank you. Very well said. And I think you have another one over here. Yes, you know, one thing from the perspective of chairman of the academic policies and programs and student life, uh, it's amazing the programs that you all have, that, that we're looking at that you say, hey, there's a need for this. And I, you know, with, uh, with Rex's leadership on that and, and just everybody looking and all the programs that we've come up with uh, that you have identified needs for. So, you know, I think I, I agree with Gary, what, what you're doing is working. Uh, we're, uh, you know, all of us are, are relatively successful in our own fields, and we know our fields. <clears throat> when we come to the uh, academic part of Austin P, we don't know what we don't know. And I think, you know, when you're talking about this happened to uh, this president of this university and whatnot, I think that's stuff we need to know. That's stuff I don't run across in my industry now, the, the Maryland football thing. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. And, uh, you know, obviously that's, that, that's national news. But there's a lot of things that you all uncover that I'd like to know on a monthly basis so I can build my knowledge to be able to, in a position to help continue to help Austin P. I'll get that to you. Okay. Yes. I would just, a couple of things. One is a brief comment from President White. After two years of being able to operate under a board of trustees rather than the board of regents, has it made a big difference in your world, an administration's world? Are you getting things done quicker? Uh, the new uh, courses, everything that you've done in the last two years, would they have happened that timely under the Board of Regents versus trustees? On the academic programs, um, what, I've, what I have seen is that we've had more um, – more attention given to what it really means to have that program. Um, it, it may not have changed the time frame on the curriculum side uh, because we still have to go through THEC for, for that. Where I think we have really been efficient and that has really changed in a positive direction for us is your ability to direct capital projects. So even though we still go through the State Building Commission, most of our projects now uh, can be handled and the process handled at the local level and, and you guys don't wait on that. You get on that, you look at that, you approve that or not approve it, you know, depending on what, what you're doing. So that has made a big difference. The other big difference is it's that, that intellectual capital that, that rests in the board. I had a wonderful relationship with the chancellor of TBR and I had really enjoyed my conversations with the board members. But I didn't contact the board members. It was not my role. They had 47 institutions. You know, it, it would be highly inappropriate. So I worked with the chancellor, and then the chancellor's role was to work with the board. In this case, if I have a question that I think you have expertise in, I call you. If, if I am concerned about something on campus that I know you're very involved in, I call you. So instead of having one person, I feel like I have a community of people, of resources. And so you know I come, I drop by. I'm still waiting for that bun and cream. But I drop by and, and, uh, and, and we visit or have lunch, you know, and I've called Vice Chair Kanata many times. And, and I feel like I have a team. And, and sometimes, and this is maybe on a more personal level, 
I feel like I have a sounding board because I have such great relationships. Not with every, I don't know everybody on campus, but I know a lot of them, and I have good relationships with, with most of them. But I, it's my job not to worry them with certain things. It's my job not to dump on them. You know, I'm to lead them, help them, support them, advocate for them. But sometimes I need a sounding board. And you are that. And, and that may be way more valuable to me than it is to them. But it's important to me because I feel the weight and the responsibility to lead and help them. And so thank you for being that. And that's where I would say some of the most significant value comes. Thank you. The second thing was Dr. Rabin mentioned a while ago the athletic department. And our athletic director, Gerald Harrison, been running around here this morning, if you had noticed, with his chest stuck out. Because as of last night, the people in Troy University in Alabama know more about Austin P this morning because their men's basketball beat them in overtime by five points, I think, last night. And the fans and Lipscomb University folks know more about us because our women's basketball team beat them last night. So two great road wins. Any other comments or questions before we adjourn? I have, I have one. Yes. Um, so thank you for your comments, President White. Um, I think one of the things that moving forward, the board kind of similar to what um, Ms. Rayburn was saying was just um, like I know that the uh, enrollment has been a plan for President White, um, but I'd like to see moving forward the retention. What are we doing to keep the students here? Um, what are the plans that are in place that we are um, implementing through multiple areas of campus to keep these students here. I think retention rates, you know, as much as we love having a great amount of students here, I want to know what's being offered and what's available to keep them and keep them all four years and uh, make sure they walk across that stage um, during their college career and, you know, what what they went through to get there. So I would always like to see that. I mean, I guess just moving forward for when we're increasing our enrollment. <laughs> Could I respond to that as well? Yes. So uh, I will say that uh, at the senior leadership team meeting about three weeks ago, uh, Provost Gandy brought uh, three sheets of activities that the university is involved in specifically. This is the year with a big push for retention. We had a consultant a couple of years ago. We've got a task force that's been working on it. Um, we have not put any money behind it because again, as you know, all the money that we've had all the, all the pennies from the, the sofa and everything else has been put in correcting the salaries. But now that we are pretty close to where we need to be, it is the time to say we really need now to take some of our resources and put in other areas of the university. And that is the push this year. And so um, I think maybe it would be appropriate uh, for the agenda next time for Dr. Gandy to work with, with um, um, Chair Chairman uh, Jenkins to bring that to the Academic Standards and Academic Affairs Committee. Is that, would that be appropriate? That would be fabulous. Thank you. For you, too? Well, I might also say Thank that uh, obviously uh, there's <coughs> two sources of funding for uh, ADAC, and uh, we have been maximizing them. We got more money than any other college this year because, because of our retention rate. So, you know, we, <coughs> we need to work the formula on both sides. We need to attract more students, but once we attract them, we need to keep them because basically our institution gets paid on both ends. We get paid to attract more students, but the graduation rate is really, is really what drives the money in the formula. And uh, we got over $2 million last year uh, for that, for the excellent job that Austin P did in retaining and graduating students. And that's obviously got to be our, uh, our mantra. Reminder that when you speak, use your microphone. One last comment, uh, Chairman. You know, you, you ask for a lot of help, and I, I watch you, and you get it. And one of, <clears throat> one of the things I like about what you do in your staff and the faculty is you, you're, you're asking for participation, et cetera. But I've noticed that you know that not all opinions are equal. And so the way you sort through that to get to the right answer is also a tribute to all the people in this room and, and your leadership, I think. So, Thank you. yes. 
be careful what you ask for because you might get it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, President White. Yes. Okay, so finally, um, in your notebooks, there's a list of interim items, and so those are just contracts of things that have been approved since the last board meeting, and so if you have any questions about any of them, they're fairly straightforward. They are behind tab. Uh, it's the very last. D. Yes. It's the last thing behind. It's the teal tab B at the very end. So if you have any questions of those, or again, I don't think there's any surprise there, but um, you can read them, and if you have any questions, then get with me or with Mitch, and we'll certainly give you the background. And thank you very much. I really I appreciate your support of Austin P and your support of our students and our faculty and our staff. And it is a privilege to work with you. You know. I move that we adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Uh, were well you gonna done. make that motion? <laughs> no. <laughs>